Hi YouTube, welcome to Pagan Perspective. This is Megan, aka Severe Street. Today is Friday, and today we are talking about being pagan and seeing a therapist, basically. I mean, we're talking about mental health, um, but the question asker is really talking about um, their experiences with a particular therapist. So um, I want to make sure that I kind of touch on all the different parts there are today because Warning, <laughs> disclaimer at the beginning of this, um, this is gonna be a long video. So just know that in advance. I am super excited about this topic. I always get excited about some really amazing topics that we have here on the show um, or on the channel, but um, I think this topic in particular really appealed to me because this is what I do. <laughs> this is my professional life. So, if you do not know, I'm gonna start with just introducing myself and why uh, I'm saying that this is my professional life and why I feel like beyond just my pagan perspective this week, I'm also going to be given, giving the uh, perspective of a mental health professional. So, a little background of me, I am a therapist. So I actually uh, technically have more schooling than a medical doctor. Uh, I've been in school for a really long time, but I have my bachelor's degree in abnormal psychology, focusing on antisocial personality disorder, borderline personality disorder, um, amongst other anxiety disorders, such as OCD and hoarding. I also completed my master's degree. I have my master's degree in marriage and family therapy with a heavy concentration in children um, and families. And my specialties were LGBTQIA plus families as well as trans um, and gender issues. And on top of that, children um, with severe behavioral issues um, and mood disorders as well as going even farther into borderline personality disorder um, in the realm of DBT. So it's a heavy focus for me. And on top of that, even beyond that scope, I'm also, I also train in DBT as well as psychodrama therapies. They're really important. And on top of that, I've completed all my coursework for a doctorate of psychology in clinical psychology, focusing on personality disorders, mood disorders, uh, the LGBT community, uh, as well as integrative therapies. So that is a big focus. The only thing I haven't completed is um, the internship for that. So. Basically, that's um, my breakdown. <laughs> so years and years and the student loans to prove it of education um, and experience. I've been working in the mental health field um, since for 17 years now, so since 2000. So a very, very long time and it is what I do. It's what I do every single day. So that being said, I was also excited about this topic because I actually did uh, a very large research project uh, for my master's degree program because I felt like they were significantly lacking when we did minority religions um, in sort of the diversity training that we do. And I felt like pagans were underrepresented. So I developed a training for them. And it's actually something that's still used by the school uh, today. So I'm gonna be touching on a little bit of what I do in that training. I I haven't yet uh, heard back. I'm not sure because it was for the training for them. I don't know if I can just make that training public for you guys, so I'm not sure. However, what I am going to do is I'm gonna be putting all of the resources that I'm gonna be talking about um, and different resources for you to look at all in uh, the little down bar area below. Now, this is going to be academic resources, so many of these things you're probably not gonna be able to find online. A lot of them you're gonna to have to go to a library to be able to find. These are academic, scientific journals. Uh, these are um, books and academic resources from peer-reviewed journals. So this is not your standard website that you can just kinda of click on and you read through. This is not for the lay person. Um, so, but you can still go read them. I mean, they're all still available to you. So uh, these are, uh, academic resources. I do put in a few though that um, you probably can find some things online about uh, just because we are a global community and some of these things are starting to have more of an online presence and websites. So that being said, you still might be able to find some information. So but just know that it's going to be a network cited formula for, for those of you who remember having to do your reference page, your works cited page. Um, it is going to be in that format. So um, and it's APA, which is um, 
uh, the standard format that I use. So that being said, um, I also would like to go into one more uh, sort of disclaimer. I mean, not really a disclaimer, but just let's, let's get this part straight at the beginning. Um, and that is about therapists in general. So um, one thing that I, I hear a lot is people trying to tell therapists what, how they should do therapy, right? They think, well, this is how you, know, you should work best um, with a client. This is how you should approach your therapy, right? And I wanna say, don't do that. And I'm gonna tell you why, so don't get... <laughs> so the reason why is because of actual science, okay? So therapy. Most people understand that every therapist is a little bit different. We all have our different styles, right? We all have different approaches, different models, different therapies. Now, when I talk about this uh, upcoming, I'm talking about therapies that are standardized. These are therapies that many therapists are using. They are known to work. They all have um, you know, good fidelity behind them, which means they work well and they have science behind them. I am not talking about harmful therapies, okay? So when I say this next statistic, I want you to know that it does not include um, things like conversion therapy, which in my opinion should never even be called therapy. Um, so it's conversion torture, and it is outlawed, outlawed in many states and um, should be outlawed federally, uh, in my opinion, and globally. Uh, so I'm not referring to those things that claim to be therapy and they're not. I'm talking about standardized practices. Um, some examples of that would be like what I mentioned before, um, one of my specialties is uh, DBT. So DBT is dialectical behavioral therapy. Um, it's a, it is its own thing, um, but it is along the same lines um, as far as the types of therapy, um, as cognitive behavioral therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy that's trauma-informed, uh, strength-based therapies, narrative therapies, emotion-focused therapies, EFT, um, among many, many others. So uh, that being said, uh, I'm referring to those therapies, those, those good therapies. So the two primary factors that influence whether or not someone will be successful in therapy, okay, the two biggest predictors of whether or not they will be successful in therapy, first and foremost is therapeutic rapport. That's the biggest one. And that's, do you mesh with a therapist? Do the two of you mesh? Do you buy into their therapy? Are you with them? Are you getting what they're saying? Are they with you, right? That therapeutic rapport, it's essential. Okay? And the second is the confidence that the therapist has in their therapy. And you're like, the confidence, really? So if they're just boisterous? No, 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 not like that. Confidence in a therapeutic setting comes from experience. It means that they have done this type of therapy for a long period of time to which they feel very confident, very educated, very informed. They can do this very, very well. Okay? Those two things combined, that is like your holy grail. Like that is, that is what you want because if you get those two things together, you're gonna have very successful therapy, regardless of the approach, regardless if it's DBT or CBT. Now, when you're looking at global for particular uh, problems that um, people come in with and say, this is a problem, because when they're identifying as a problem, that's when we say it's a problem, right? And so they come in and they say, this is a problem for me. So those particular things, um, for example, borderline personality disorder, DBT is the gold standard, okay, for treating borderline personality disorder. So you might not treat uh, borderline personality disorder with emotion-focused therapy, right? If you know that there's a gold standard of DBT, it might be something that you would then seek out the DBT therapist. Now, that's not to say that it can't work. Of course, it can work. Uh, it's just that if you know it's the best for that particular thing, why not go to the best thing for that particular thing, right? So the reason why I say that confidence is important and the reason why I want you to never try and change your therapist, okay, so bear with me here, is that that confidence is important. Them being able to deliver therapy that they know in and out, inside and out, they know how to help you help yourself is super, super important. So go with me on this. Imagine there's this phenomenal opera singer, fabulous opera singer, okay? 
And this opera singer is world known for, for their amazing voice, right? And you go up to them and, and they're like, I'm gonna sing a song for you, any song you want. And you're like, eh, I'm just not feeling opera today. Sing me a country song, right? This is what will make me feel better if you sing me a country song. Now here's the thing, that opera singer is very technically, you know, sound, knows their craft, is, is awesome. So more than likely, the country song is still gonna sound really, really good, right? So if you ask your therapist to do a particular type of therapy with you that they're not familiar with, they're still trained. They're still gonna generally be able to do pretty good. So it's not like that you're gonna get bad therapy. It's just you'll miss out on that special, special spark of something that when it, they're doing their thing, right? So when the opera singer is singing their stuff, right, in their genre, what's amazing for them, you're gonna get that extra special something. And when you combine that with the therapeutic rapport, you combine that with finding a therapist that you really mesh well with, it's magic. It really is, it's beautiful what can happen. It's amazing when you have that combination. And so what I say is don't try and change your therapist. Right? You don't try and make your therapist behave differently. Just change your therapist, as in change the person you go see, right? Because there is somebody out there who works the way that you want them to work and that they're confident in, and that's their style. So that's my disclaimer is try not to tell your therapist how to do the therapy. Instead, find a therapist who does the therapy that you want them to do. Does that make sense? <laughs> so, because there are so many different kinds of therapists, and if they're not working for you, then the therapy's not gonna work for you, okay? And no matter how much that you want them to work for you, it's not likely, okay, to work unless you're feeling that connection, and that is super, super important. So, to the question asker, that's my biggest thing, it does not seem like you're meshing, okay? First off, the biggest red flag for me is the term enabling. All right, you, you said that your therapist said that your pagan faith is enabling you right now. I would never ever use that. And in my training, I actually talk all about that. So we're gonna get to that later. <laughs> um, and I believe in one of the videos, you might have mentioned um, something about what you're struggling with too, um, because I think somebody mentioned something about schizophrenia and schizotypal, um, so, and we'll get into that as well. So basically, what I'm trying to say is Pick your therapist. So, how do you pick a therapist, right? What are you gonna look for? Well, that's why I'm here. <laughs> so that's why I'm trying to segue into this. So, and I know we're already, oh my gosh, we're so far in, I'm looking at the time. All right, well, let me start with saying, first off, um, the American Religious Identification Survey, um, this heiress, uh, gives the estimate that there are 750,000 Wiccans, 305,000 Druids, Neo-Pagans, and other Pagans in the United States. Okay, this is basically placing pagans at over 1 million, all right? And this, this is still outdated. This is the last time we got data, which was almost five years ago, okay? So we're talking about a, a good period of time here. So basically, though, when we look at the numbers between that and the previous, we are the fastest growing religion in the United States. It's amazing. It's awesome. So, um, and that comes from Jensen. So... Next, all right, I wanna make sure I give a couple more little little bits of um, statistics for you guys. So, the other big statistic I wanted to just talk about a little bit was um, the differences in um, pagans in general. Um, so this comes from the pagan census. Again, um, it's all cited below. And the pagan census talked about how, um, uh, how open and accepting of the LGBT community pagans were. Uh, and, and actually, let me make sure I have it here. Sorry, I have, it's a very long uh, research report here. I'm trying to make sure I have the correct information for you. Um, and so over at 92%, okay, over 92% of pagans uh, supported gay marriage. So uh, this was previous to the federal amendment. Uh, so it was huge at this time uh, because the nationwide average was almost the reverse of that. Uh, and so one of the things to consider um, when working uh, with pagans is uh, the openness, right? And their ability to, um, to be welcoming, right? To anyone and 
not just welcoming but warm right and so that's really important because what that says is that pagans when they go into therapy uh, I don't want to say pleasers right um, that's not really the right word but it's it's that pagans in general and I do say very generally <laughs> they they want to love right they want we want to love people we want uh, to be welcoming and we want to give people chances right your therapist isn't the place to do that so what I need you to do instead is I want you to be picky I want you to be super super picky because this is somebody that you are going to be basically letting into your little world and um, into the little world inside your brain right you want to be picky about this and you are entitled to be picky be super picky interview them you don't set an appointment with a therapist and go in and just think that well then I'm stuck that's who I got now unfortunately and we're so not gonna get into the topic of healthcare right now so I understand insurance I know many of you might not have a lot of choice in therapists okay so if you're in that spot private message me below okay send me a message um, you know do it through the the pagan perspective Facebook page do it down below some private message me and we'll figure out something there's always 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 a way around it all right we will do whatever we need to do to be able to help you um, try and find a therapist that works for you so because there, there are therapists now here's the thing it might mean not being able to stay in the area you're at or it might you know there's all sorts of things you might have to travel farther that kind of thing but we will do our best um, if you are in an area that we call uh, sort of a, a a mental health desert right um, and that is where there is just not a lot of providers um, and you are struggling okay with your mental health and you you want help uh, I really really suggest reaching out um, to neighboring towns and to moving out of your area because your mental health is super super important and if you're seeing the problem um, then we want to make sure that you get help so because there are some areas of the country where there just aren't enough providers and it's sad um, so that being said um, one of the things that's important to that I, I do want to mention here before we get into how to pick your therapist I want to mention what I am so what type of um, therapy I do so when I go into a therapy session so my belief is that the therapist is there uh, to help the client right see change in themselves help the client change themselves right we can't change no one no therapist can make a client change so let's get that idea out of your head no no therapist out there okay worth their salt and I do say worth their salt because I'm not saying there's not horrible people out in the world but there's horrible people in every profession I'm talking about like you know the, the good ones right the average ones so they, they are not gonna change you they can't force you to change they can't rewire your brain it's just it's not gonna happen right that's not what we're trained for and we're talking about years and years of training here and so no matter what people think that, that you know um, that we rewire clinicians rewire brain and um, we don't do that and so but what we do is you come in with a problem right so at that point right that's when we call it mental illness that's when we give a diagnosis and diagnoses are important um, while I have a problem with the medicalized nature of a lot of it having a diagnosis can be incredibly empowering for a lot of people and for other people it can be disempowering okay however what it does is it gives a framework and so what you need to be able to do is say and you can even say this to your therapist you can say look I don't want to know my diagnosis right because here's the thing the therapist most likely is not going to tell you your diagnosis um, it's not something that we do in fact most therapists don't want to have to tell anybody the diagnosis the diagnosis honestly we don't believe it should go anywhere but just the therapist and the client it should be something that all it is is a framework for the therapist to be able to provide therapy that's it it shouldn't be anything more than that uh, I should never go to an insurance company or anything that's a whole nother topic for me it should never go there but what it does do is it, it's a working framework and my visualization is it's always in pencil okay 
or in my case, erasable pen. Um, but the point is, is that the diagnosis is never a firm set thing, right? Our, our mental health is fluid and it changes, right? So one day you can come in, you know, one month you can come in and you know, you might meet all the criteria for borderline personality disorder, right? And then you go through a year of DBT uh, group and training um, and phone consultations and everything that you need to do as part of the DBT program. And you come back after that year and many times we see people, they literally cannot score for BPD anymore. They can't do it. They literally have helped themselves through the therapist helping them help themselves to a place where they no longer meet all the criteria for that diagnosis, right? And so, and that's because they wanted help, right? So the majority of people who come into therapy are coming because they want to. Now, yes, there are some people who are forced into therapy and all of that. And that's, there is, like I said, this video could be hours and hours long. I've, I've had more than a decade worth of training in this. It's, I'm gonna do my best. However, the majority of people come into therapy because they want change, because something isn't working in their life. They don't feel good. They want help, right? The majority of people who seek out therapy say, I don't feel good. And usually they come in and they say, make me feel better. And I go, I can't make you feel better. I can't make you feel better. I can give you the tools though to help you make yourself feel better. Okay, so that's the difference. So that's how I run my therapy. Um, I am very directive though. I am very much involved. When you get me, you get me 100%. I am in there with you, right? And I'm gonna call you on your stuff, right? I'm gonna say, hey, whoa, bro, are you, are you kind of trying to trick yourself here, right? Because we do that sometimes. We'll, um, we really want something and that's our goal, but then in the moment, we don't feel like doing it, so we kind of like justify the reasons why we're not gonna do it, and I'm like, hey, wait a minute, this is your goal, this is what you're working toward, let's keep on this. And usually, it, I get a lot of grumps and groans, and in the end though, it's like, wow, thank you so much for helping me stay on target with the goal that I wanted, right? And so that's super important. So. Anyway, getting off track a little bit. So that is the type of therapy that I do. Uh, mine is 100% unconditional positive regard. I am there for you. I am not there for me. So uh, a therapist is never uh, there for themselves. Now, this again, I'm talking about a good therapist here. <laughs> there's bad ones, there's bad ones. But what a therapist should be is uh, they are there for you. So oftentimes we call that the mirror, right? So they are a mirror holding up so that you can see things that you didn't see before, right? And they're, they can kind of move that mirror around so that you can see in nooks and crannies. And they're kind of a special mirror in a way that they also can help provide, uh, I would say maybe different angles and, per, and reflections. They can do a, you know, a nighttime version. They can do a daytime version. They can do different lighting sources, thermal imaging, <laughs> all of that. Basically, we have a whole host of tools at our disposal to help you help yourself. And that's super important. Uh, and the way that we do that is through a different therapeutic techniques. So. I'm an integrative therapist, which means that I use multiple different techniques. I am confident in many of them because I've been trained in so many and I've been doing this so long. And I integrate them. And then I also train other therapists on how to integrate them. In fact, one of the things that I do uh, that is particularly um, popular, I should say, is my combination of DBT therapy and psychodrama. Psychodrama comes from um, a very old, uh, form of uh, psychology. Um, basically, so Murano was a contemporary of Freud. I'm sure you've heard of him. Uh, only Murano's psychodrama, uh, what he was doing at the time, actually is still practiced today and is still amazing. Uh, unlike some of Freud's <laughs> stuff, it's, you know, it's good reference material for the history. Uh, but Murano is amazing. And psychodrama is a phenomenal uh, form of group therapy. Uh, that then Gestalt took and morphed into more of an individual form of therapy. If you look up Gestalt, uh, Gestalt's all about calling you on your shit. Uh, you know, it's all about like, let's, let's get in there. At the same time, there's unconditional positive regard, which is really, really important. Um, and so I kind of take all the best of the psychodrama and I combine it with the 
amazing, amazing skills training, uh, validation, um, and ways of thinking that dialectical behavioral therapy uh, is. And basically, in a nutshell, uh, the dialectical behavioral therapy is uh, is a way of looking at uh, your life, your mind, your world, and seeing the ands instead of the buts. Okay, <laughs> and what that means is that, for example, right, you can love someone and hate them at the same time. I love you and I hate you, okay? Two things can be held as true, two opposite things can be held as true at the exact same time and there's no contradiction there. That's really important because if you hear the words, I love you but I hate you, right? Right? I love you, but you messed up, right? The but completely invalidates what came before it. And it's very detrimental, especially if you grow up with that invalidation, constant invalidation. And so the and, right? I love you, and you really could have, you know, maybe tried harder on that, right? I love you, and sometimes I hate your actions, right? So those things are what kind of a big core of DBT is about. There's so much to DBT though. I mean, it's huge and there's no way I could go into it here, but um, we're talking about interpersonal um, communication. We're talking about mindfulness. We're talking about um, amazing, amazing distress tolerance levels. Um, we're talking about validation. We're talking about all sorts of things, right? Emotion regulation. Um, so for those of you who know DBT, you probably know your wise mind, right? You, are you acting in wise mind? Um, and for those of you who don't know, uh, the idea in DBT is that we split up the mind into three separate parts. You have your emotion mind, your rational mind, and where they intercede, where they cross, so if you have two circles, right, and you put them together, this little part in the center, that's your wise mind. And wise mind happens when emotion mind and rational mind agree on something. Um, and so we try and always strive for being in wise mind, but sometimes we have to be in rational mind. Uh, that's just something that, and once you learn to be able to uh, train your mind to think uh, in that way, it's really amazing what you can do because it allows you to have more distress tolerance um, when you need it, um, and it allows you to tap into your emotions and be more validated because one of the biggest problems is that we're not validated enough. So, okay. Back to uh, the question, um, pagans in mental health. It's always been a concern um, for mental health practitioners because of the supernatural side of it. Um, so speaking with spirits, um, seeing, uh, seeing different apparitions or speaking with elementals um, or different deities while in ritual or even not in ritual, all of those things can send off red flags to more traditional therapists, right? Who are not as well versed, which is why my training was so important. Um, more and more therapists now are getting training. Um, there are a number of different trainings that are going around. In fact, there's even a training for social workers um, on dealing with foster families um, and foster children. Um, either the foster family is pagan or the children coming in are pagan. Um, and so it's really been amazing. There is also a spiritual assessment, um, which, um, I, yeah, I'll, I can put the spiritual assessment in, oh, uh, maybe. If I can, I will put it in the down bar below. I need to check um, the copyright on that. Um, I don't know if it can be provided to the general public or if it's just for um, therapy practitioners. So I will check on that. But there is a spiritual assessment um, and I can, so basically some of those things, um, and you'd be asking questions. So for example, you would say like, what sort of personal experiences or practices stand out to you during your years at home? What made these experiences special? How have they informed your later life? So things like that. Um, it's a spiritual assessment just to get a general idea of um, somebody's spirituality um, and to find out more about how important it is. Um, so one of the things that I focused on in my training was talking about uh, different ritual tools that pagans might have in the home because many therapists actually work in the home. They're home-based practitioners. We do have some in office. However, many of them now are home-based. And so they're going to see certain ritual tools. 
okay? And so part of the training is to train them about those things and they need that training. And so one of the things that I will stress is when you are being picky and you're finding a therapist that's perfect for you, you need to make sure that you ask these questions. Ask them, have you ever had a pagan client before? Um, have you uh, had any experiences um, with paganism? What is your exposure to pa paganism? How much do you know about paganism and are you willing to learn, okay? So here's the difference. You don't wanna change the therapeutic style of a therapist, okay? You never wanna change that because you want somebody who's the best in their field. So you always wanna find the therapist that meets your therapeutic style of what you want, right? So don't make them change for you. You go to the one that's the best of the best, okay? However, what you do want to do is you want to get them to research paganism. It is not your job to educate them about your religion. I'm gonna say that again. It is not your job as the client to educate the therapist about your religion. Okay? Same way it would not be if somebody came in who was a person of color. It would not be their job to educate their therapist about racial issues. Okay, So it is the therapist's job. Okay, It's what they get paid for. Okay, We don't get paid enough, but it's what they get paid for. They need to educate themselves about your religion. That doesn't mean there won't be questions. Okay, However, it means that they should have a baseline understanding. Okay, Now, if you want, I would suggest steering them in the right direction. The reason why I would suggest this is, I wouldn't suggest this necessarily for um, like a Catholic, okay? Or um, even, even somebody who's Jewish, I wouldn't suggest it for. And the reason why is because there aren't a ton of variation in those religions. So when they look up information, they're gonna basically find the general good information. However, when they look up paganism, there are so many variations. I mean, goodness gracious, we have so many traditions all lumped into this giant umbrella called paganism where, you know, some of them are very, very different, right? So in when we say in general paganism, we are being broad. I mean, we're talking about big, broad strokes here, and I know it. It is not, this in no way is the rule whatsoever when I say these these generalizations and so um, giving the therapist a more narrow field to research would be really helpful so for example if you um, if your tradition is primarily um, Wiccan for example you could say well I practice Wicca right and maybe even be um, really particular about that say Alexandrian Wicca right if, you, if that's what you do. Um, you could also say, well, I am eclectic, but I have Hellenistic leanings, right? Or I'm Reconstructionist, or I'm, you know, I am a Druid and I'm part of a grove, right? And this is what I have done for this many years and before that I was this. So it allows you to be able to narrow uh, the focus for your therapist so that they can learn as much as possible um, that will be more pertinent to you. Okay, so that's super big. So first thing is if you like this therapist, which I don't think you should, well, here's the thing. You do what you're gonna do. My personal step out of my therapist hat for a second, I don't like the word enabling. I, I don't use that in, in my practice. So I, I would just say it might be time to see another therapist and kind of start fresh. But if you feel like you've invested a lot and you do have good therapeutic rapport in other ways with the this therapist, then what I would suggest is go in from scratch and say, all right, it's not my job to educate you on my religion. I need you to learn about this and say, this is my tradition. This is what I would like for you to um, educate yourself about and be more knowledgeable for me because that will help me. Okay. If your therapist says no, you find another therapist. That's done. If a therapist won't do that for you, they, A, are not a good therapist. They're just not because a therapist, that is their job. Their job is to be educated in the best ways to help you help yourself, okay? Second is part of my training and what I do is talking to therapists about um, the pagan uh, experiences. So what they call the supernatural experiences, but we basically it's our divine experiences, um, right? Our experiences with uh, other dimensions, other planes, um, uh, fey folk, all of this, it can appear to some therapists as uh, a mental health issue. And here's the rub. Sometimes 
you have a pagan who has these experiences and then on top of it still has schizotypal or schizophrenia and has hallucinations and delusions on top of having actual real experiences with the divine on a different plane. How do you make heads or tails of that? Well, first you get a therapist who understands that. So the first step first is they need to educate themselves. Therapist has to educate themselves on what is, what is okay, more typical for a pagan to experience. Okay. What is something within the realm? And then the second thing, the absolute second thing is, is it bothering you? Okay, this is what I say to every single client because for me, I'm not gonna pathologize you, okay? What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, do you think this is a problem? Is this affecting your, your life in a negative way, all right? That's the big thing. We call it, we have something called maladaptive. So basically, you can have a coping strategy, right? So somebody's coping strategy might be having a glass of wine after dinner, okay? Now somebody's like, oh, well they could be an alcoholic. Well, no. Not necessarily. Things aren't inherently okay, good or bad. It's how is it affecting you? Okay? That's so let me give an example. People will say, Oh, I made a bad choice. And I say, No, you didn't. You didn't make a bad choice, you made a choice, right? That choice might have made you feel bad, right? Or had bad consequences for your life, right? But the choice that you made is just a choice. Choices are neither bad nor good, okay? It's only the consequences of those choices that end up being positive or negative for us personally, right? So for example, eating a cookie. So eating a cookie is a choice, right? So if you eat that cookie after you've just eaten like a five course dinner and all this and you're so stuffed and you just cram it down and it gives you a stomach ache, you might say, oh my gosh, eating that cookie was such a bad choice. <laughs> it's like, because I feel horrible. It's like, no, it's not a bad choice. Look, eating the cookie wasn't a bad choice, right? Eating the cookie, okay, made you feel bad. The choice of eating the cookie, right, made you feel bad, right? Versus if, you know, you had, you know, a snack of a cookie and it tasted amazing and you were awesome, then you can say, oh, that was such a good choice, right? Well, no, that was a choice. Eating a cookie made me feel good, right? And so what I, this is again, more dialectical. So basically the idea is that we don't place judgment on those things. Um, and so you don't make bad choices or good choices, you make choices, right? Um, and so I'm getting, getting off the topic, but it's really important that, um, that when we're talking about mental health, we're talking about maladaptive versus adaptive thinking, right? So the way that you think, okay, the way that your brain works, if it works for you and you're okay with it, then it's adaptive, all right? Then it's working. If it doesn't work for you, if it makes you feel bad, then it's maladaptive, right? So the pathologizing part of it, when we say mental illness, right? Somebody could be experiencing something that doesn't bother them at all. And to somebody else, they might say, wait, that, isn't that depression or isn't that a personality disorder or something? And they're like, hey, I'm okay. I feel good. I feel awesome. And it's not hurting anybody, right? So it's not maladaptive to other people around you either. Then it's adaptive. Then your coping skill and what you're doing is fine. The problem comes, the mental illness part, comes when it's a problem for you and the people around you, right? That's when it's a serious issue, when it is hurting those around you, hurting yourself. And I mean hurting yourself as far as giving you distress, right? If it is upsetting to you or hindering you in some way from meeting your goals, any of those things. So that's what we're addressing when we talk about mental illness or when I talk about mental illness, is about how is this a problem for you? Tell me about it. So some people tell me that, you know, they are, they've got some obsessions, right, with things. I don't like to use the word OCD, right, because it's overused and it's not used correctly. Um, but they'll say they get very focused, uh, very attentive to certain things, and they'll say, oh yeah, I'm totally, totally obsessed with this, right? And and I'll say, okay, well, does it work for you? Does, do you enjoy it? Is it 
Is it working? And is it working for everybody else around you? And they'll be like, oh, yeah, yeah, they think it's great. You know, they have an obsession with um, gardening, okay? And they're like, oh, my gosh, everyone loves my flowers. It's amazing, right? And then you have somebody else, right, who has an obsession, right, with buying things. And their house fills up. And they start hoarding. And their family can't live in the house anymore and there's insects everywhere and it's becoming unhealthy, then it's a problem. Then it's maladaptive, right? So they might think, well, I love shopping and it makes me feel good, right? However, is it harming them? Yes, it is because it's harming their health, right? Like we're talking about science here. It's harming their health, all of that cockroach droppings and everything like that um, and the shed skin, all of it's bad. And their family, right, is saying, look, this is horrible, this is bad, the, the, this person's gonna lose their house, right? It's gonna be condemned, so then they won't have a place to live. So that's maladaptive, right? And so at that point, then we come in and say, look, this isn't working, let's find something else, right? And so that's the other part that I wanted to talk about. When you're saying that this person, the therapist is saying you're being enabled, what I wanna know is what have you done to replace those things? Because I will never work with a client to help themselves um, by removing a coping skill that they have until they have a coping skill that's a replacement already in place, right? So for example, um, like if you, if you want to, um, if you want to move something, right? And you want to hold the place of something else, you need to move something into that area right right away it needs to be able to come right in it's got to be ready to go right there indiana jones right the the pressure sensor thing when he moves he wants to move the thing off and move <laughs> move the weighted sandbag or whatever right onto it you need to have that coping skill ready to go so you need to work on building new coping skills uh, that will work for you that are more adaptive right that are something that you enjoy uh, that make you feel good um, about things and you want to move that right into whatever we're taking out that's maladaptive right so think about it like this if you're um if you have a car and um the brake pads have gone right you're not just going to remove the brake pads and then drive around and wonder what to do no you're going to remove the brake pads and put new ones in right so you need to have those new brake pads ready to go right then and there to be able to put right in so when something doesn't work for you anymore you need to remove it right and put something else in its place so that those things work for you then it's super important so goodness this is getting way too long I I would love to talk more about this I feel like there's so much more I can talk about so to the question asker um, I don't know your story and so I'm not gonna say you know whether or not the enabling thing I can say I don't like the term enable enabling um, I think that if you if you feel a good therapeutic rapport with this therapist, I would definitely recommend, and I would recommend this as a mental health professional, okay? I would recommend you asking them to educate themselves on paganism, on your specific type of paganism, you know, whatever that might be. Um, if you would let them know what that is and ask them to educate themselves, okay? If you do not have a good therapeutic rapport with this therapist, I highly, highly, highly professionally, <laughs> professionally recommend that you seek out another therapist, okay? Um, I wouldn't want you to give up your therapist uh, if they are providing some support until you have a new one. Um, so the same thing, don't just give it up without one that's immediately gonna go into its place, right? But I would actually ask your therapist and say, look, this isn't necessarily working for me. Um, I really feel like I need somebody who understands uh, my religion more because it's very important to me. And can you recommend any other therapists? Oftentimes, um, depending on where you are, if they're at a, at a big agency, there's other therapists there at the agency who might be able to understand. Um, so, you know, it's all something where uh, you need to basically say, is do I want to stay with this person or am I ready to try somebody else? So that would be what I would recommend. Um, and as far as mental health goes, you know, it's really, really important that you are very, very careful um, when it comes to legal issues um, and 
sort of the pagan realm. So uh, the Pagans in the Law book, super, super important. Just remember that you have rights, okay? Now, in certain states, it gets tricky, okay? And so um, I understand that and be safe. Take care of yourself um, and just be wary of that. Study up. Pagans of the Law is an amazing resource. That book will help you. Um, as far as therapists go, really look for different things. If you are looking for um, kind of gold standards, I recommend always looking for a therapist who is familiar with dialectical behavioral therapy. It's considered a gold standard. It's amazing therapeutic practice. And as long as they're familiar with it, you're going to get, you know, some pretty good therapy because it means that they had to go through a lot of hoops to get there, uh, which means they're trained and experienced. So second is cognitive behavioral therapy. If you see DBT and CBT or TFCBT, okay, trauma focused, those are also very good therapies, okay? If you see somebody who's a narrative therapist, narrative therapy can be very good for mood disorders, okay? However, if you are struggling with things um, more like anxiety, I would definitely suggest doing DBT or CBT. Just, but if you have a mood disorder, um, so that means that you feel like you have a disorder in your mood, okay? So if you feel like my mood is not right, right? I'm depressed all the time, right? Or I'm having super highs and super lows. Um, that um, if I feel like uh, I want to hurt myself, right? So narrative therapy can be very good for that. If you feel like you are chronically suicidal, DBT is by far the best therapy though, okay? So just feeling really low, narrative therapy can be very helpful. However, chronic suicidality and cutting DBT is absolutely one of the best therapies for it, okay? There are hotlines you can call, okay? National hotlines if you are feeling suicidal, okay? So that is why I said I wanted to touch on people who are forced, quote unquote, forced to go to therapy. Um, I, we don't have time to go into it too much. However, you know, if we're talking about somebody who's institutionalized, uh, my number one goal whenever I've been working with um, children or adults who are in residential care, residential care is hospitalization. Whenever I'm working with them, I let them know that yes, the law or their parents might be saying they have to come and see me. However, I do not make them talk. If they wanna come and they wanna sit there and do absolutely nothing, stare at a wall, they wanna to talk to me about the weather, they wanna color, they wanna play a game, they do not have to talk to me. I never force anyone into therapy. Their parents might say they have to come to me. The federal government might say they have to come to me and that's fine. That, those, those authorities outside me say they have to sit in my office, right? Or I have to go to, you know, they have to sit with me for 50 minutes. That's fine, we'll sit there and we'll sit there in silence if that's what the client wants because I will not force anybody into therapy, okay? And I don't know a single therapist personally who would, okay? All of the therapists that I've trained with have been amazing. And I, I don't know a single therapist who'd ever force anyone to therapy. You just sit there, you're quiet, you wanna play a game. I mean, I can't even tell you how many games of Uno I have played, uh, chess I have played, okay? We'll sit there and color. We'll sit there and do a collage. We'll sit there. And I've gone through entire therapy sessions with not a single word spoken. We sit there and play with the kinetic sand. It's one of my favorite things. I have a huge tub of it. Um, you do not need to be forced into therapy. And no good therapist is ever going to force you into therapy. Okay? So just know that. Um, so how, what I am going to do, though, is if somebody comes to me and um, they tell me one of three things, they're gonna hurt themselves, they're gonna hurt somebody else, right? Or somebody is hurting them. I am a mandated reporter and I have to help, okay? That is because life is important, okay? And so that's really important. So in the end, what I really wanna just talk about because I'm, this is way too long, is that you are important. And so if it's not, if the therapy isn't working for you, okay? Ask your therapist, for what you need, okay? Say, look, I need a new therapist or I need you to educate yourself about paganism, okay? 
find a therapist who meets your best needs, right? So if you're out there looking for a therapist, you know, you don't need to just take any old therapy. And you don't want to find you don't want to find a emotion focused therapist who's never done DBT before and say, "I want you to do DBT." It's not their specialty. They're not going to be able to do it. So remember, don't force a therapist to do a therapy practice that they're not educated in. However, okay? You can ask them to be educate themselves on your religion, right? Okay? They just a therapy practice is different. It takes years to learn that. It's not like a research thing. So it's better just to find somebody who's an expert in it. Find someone who's an expert in the therapy that you want because they're out there, okay? And you can always research that. So find a therapist who does what you want them to do and then ask them to educate themselves about your religion, okay? That is all I think for today. Way too long. I'm so sorry if you have any questions, put them in the down bar. I will do my best to try and answer as many as I can. Um, and as always, guys, blessed be and aloha.